when you look at AI, I know this could be facing, for example, cybersecurity, but it's also how you speak to clients to capitalize on some of the relationships. How, how, where do you see the use of AI actually ending? Uh, the great majority today of our investments in AI is on um, customer facing um, initiatives, solutions. We use AI to deliver better services to customers, to understand the risks better, and to improve the customer satisfaction. Of course, the issue with AI is where will AI go and what uh, dangerous threats will AI create over time. But at the moment, AI is an incredible benefit uh, for us in, for customer satisfaction and customer development. And that's the reason we're investing so heavily into it, both in technology and in people. Uh, Mario, there's of course a large number of the population worldwide that is still not insured. Can AI also help with this yeah. insurance gap, as it were, by making it more affordable? Yeah, one thing, Francine, that I'd like to clarify on this is because often I hear discussions on um, gap of protection and climate. I don't see that. I think people um, um, find opportunities to insure themselves for climate. Uh, it could be expensive, but it's out there. There are other forms of insurance for pensions, for health, for cyber, which are really not there. And this is where we as an industry and the governments and the um, association, the stakeholders, have to find solutions for. Because there are reasons why these uh, kind of risks uh, are not insured today. And I don't think AI will, will, will help um, in finding the solutions. I think we need a different approach from governments, from stakeholders, in allowing the solutions to be available to people. And this is a really interesting, of course, topic that also, I, I guess, touches generative AI. I don't know whether the, there are things because of climate change, but also because of our use of AI that you see becoming more insurable. Are, are there products or, or events that you think going forward will be much more harder to insure? I, I, I don't think uh, they will become harder. I think they will become more expensive. Um, and I don't think, honestly, that this, um, that this price differential is unfair because what's happening uh, through AI, through digital, through computer, is that uh, we understand better the individual risk that uh, some factories, some plants, or some houses, or um, you know, some specific installations and locations represent, which means that all the other people will pay less because they're not subsidizing these risks. Um, and so it targets uh, the riskiness to um, individual uh, risk elements, which again, is, it is fair. Now, what to do sometimes uh, um, will need um, some social solutions because some risks uh, could just become excessively priced and too expensive. And then we need to figure out what to do. Um, a lot of this also, it's about prevention and, um, you know, we've been investing a lot on working with the customers on prevention. Uh, this has been the uh, highest growth part of our business over the last four or five years. And we continue to invest on the team of people who do prevention with our clients. Our targets for net zero that the world has set itself still achievable or do we need to get ready for a world where temperatures have risen by 1.5 percent, or 1.5, um, you know, centigrades, and, and what does that mean for the insurance sector? I think we're already in the situation that you describe. I think the world is already warmer. Um, I think we are already there, um, and I think we need to face the consequences of this, which makes prevention so important, and it means also working very, um, um, you know quickly and dynamically with uh, all the people to um, um, minimize the impact. I'm very concerned about heating. Uh, we've been working with a number of big cities on uh, uh, what to do about uh, heating of their um, you know, um, cities and then the impact on their citizens. I'm very concerned about water shortage and availability of water. And these are the, all the things that uh, we, we are um, keen to work with, uh, um, you know, mayor, with organization, with governments, with individuals. Um, we're already in that scenario.
So, uh, do you worry that you know the risks? There are more risks of U.S. social inflation keeping on rising. And of course, this is a term that describes, you know, insurers' claim costs that are increasing above the economic inflation. Uh, yeah, but, but, but not that much, honestly. I mean, social inflation has been there forever. It goes up and down. It changes uh, um, depending on the years. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, and, and we're never going to get rid of it. Um, I don't see today this as uh, a major threat to the insurance results. Um, in our books, we have a relatively limited impact because we have shrunk uh, casualty exposure, which is where social inflation manifests itself over the past years. So I see it, uh, but I, I don't think that uh, for us or for the industry, this is the biggest uh, uh, risk um, over the next years. Um, Mario, as of course what, one of the most important chief executives of one of the largest insurance companies, what keeps you up at night? What are you worried about the most? <laughs> look, um, if, I, if I look back and if I think about the last uh, three years, uh, what should have been worrying me three years ago where uh, the potential for a pandemic, the potential for a war in Europe, the potential for a war near to Europe, the potential for a recession, the potential for uh, high inflation. Um, luckily, I did not see any of these things coming, and so I slept quite well. Uh, but this is what, um, if I wake up in the night, I keep thinking about uh, what am I missing seeing, what I have not yet understood that it's coming on us. It is the um, unforeseen, the unexpected, that really um, a company as big as we are, you know, tries to... Uh, anticipate everything, but we did not anticipate uh, any of these uh, things that I just mentioned. And this is really what uh, keeps me awake at night. You had a good set of results and you gave back to shareholders. Is there a danger that, and this is not only Zurich, but your industry at large, financial services at large are in a race to give back to shareholders, which is very much appreciated if you're a shareholder, but that means you're taking away capital from, from natural investments that maybe need doing. Um, yeah, uh, we're very mindful of what you say, and we consider that continuously. In our case, um, we have a business model which is uh, run for cash. We want to create continuous cash. And so we think it's fair to give back a portion of this cash each year, which for us is 75% of what we create in profits each year. We want to give it back to shareholders. This is our commitment. Um, but we keep investing um, heavily each year on developments like digital. We keep investing on the skills of our people. One of the things I'm very happy is about uh, the growth of the skills of uh, our colleagues around the world over the past years. Uh, we, we have kept growing um, the base of our employees. Um, so we take a long-term view on everything we do. And with that, I think that our distribution policies are healthy, sustainable, and wise. Uh, but I, I understand what you mean, and we're very, very mindful and careful on that.